On the MCAT, some cars passages are about history. Some are about philosophy and some are about politics. If you're like me, the philosophical ones that are chock full of metaphors are the ones that really give you trouble. And I got one for you today. It's passage seven in the AAMC sample test car section. So sometimes I like to scroll down to the bottom and see what the title is. And it looks like this one's called Metaphors We Live By. So again, it's going to be one of those really uh, philosophical ones. If you don't know how I go about this at this point, I kind of just read through the passage and I will stop at the end of every idea and I will kind of summarize what I'm thinking thus far. Metaphor is for most people a device of the poetic imagination and the rhetorical flourish, a matter of extraordinary rather than ordinary language. First sentence is always just going to be introducing your idea. We're talking here about metaphors and how, I guess, how they relate to our life or our language. Moreover, metaphor is typically viewed as characteristic of language alone, a matter of words rather than thought or action. For those reasons, most people think they can get along perfectly well without metaphor. We have found, on the contrary, always pay attention to any buts, on the contrary, however, is anything that the author is going to lay out this idea and then take a different stance, that's an important transition word. We have found, on the contrary, that metaphor is pervasive in everyday life, not just in language, but in thought and action. Our ordinary conceptual system, in terms of which we both think and act, is fundamentally metaphorical in nature. So some people would stop here and they would prefer to kind of write out a paragraph summary. I tend not to do that. I find that if I do that myself, I pay more attention to individual arguments rather than the whole main idea as a whole. Um, so therefore, I like to just stop and mentally take note of what the main idea is up to this point. So far, it seems like the author is taking the stance that metaphors are pervasive, um, not just in our language, but in our thought and action as well. The concepts that govern our thought are not just matters of the intellect. They also govern our everyday functioning down to the most mundane details. Our concepts structure what we perceive and how we get around in the world and how we relate to other people. Our conceptual system thus plays a central role in defining our everyday realities. If we are right in suggesting that our conceptual system is largely metaphorical, then the way we think, what we experience, and what we do every day is very much a matter of metaphor. So again, I think the author's sticking with their original statement that metaphors are pervasive in life, but um, they are just kind of reaching out and saying, even in our um, social relationships and even in our everyday realities, metaphor is very pervasive. So kind of just the same thing. But again, we want to pay attention to words like that. Our conceptual system is not something we are normally aware of. In most of the little things we do every day, we simply think and act more or less automatically along certain lines. Just what these lines are is by no means obvious. One way to find out is by looking at language. Since communication is based on the same conceptual system that we use in thinking and acting, language is an important source of evidence for what the system is like. So I feel like the first and second paragraphs were more or less um, a certain argument that we can look at. It may even be the main idea at this point, but that was an argument. Now we have another argument. That argument being that we are normally not aware of our um, conceptual system, but maybe that language is kind of um, a lens that we can look into this conceptual system since it is kind of a source of evidence, as they call it. Primarily on the basis of linguistic evidence, we have found that most of our ordinary conceptual system is metaphorical in nature, and we have found a way to begin to identify in detail just what the metaphors are that structure how we perceive, how we think, and what we do. So I feel like this paragraph plays into this argument, and I feel like they are setting up for a new argument about identifying these metaphors that we live by. So if I were taking this in my test, I would stop right here and I would summarize the whole paragraph that I had read so far. So taking the place of the author, I would say our lives are metaphorical and even when we are not aware, language can give us an idea of what that looks like. It's not a fully fleshed out main idea yet, but I'm just summarizing what I've thought of so far. It keeps me active reading. When I, when I mention active reading, that's what I mean. I mean, thinking about what came before the paragraph that you're currently reading and thinking about what might come after. To give some idea of what it could mean for a concept to be metaphorical and for such a concept to structure an everyday activity, let's, let us start with the concept argument and the conceptual metaphor argument is war. 
The metaphor is reflected in our everyday language by a wide variety of expressions. Your claims are indefensible. He attacked every weak point in my argument. If you use that strategy, he'll wipe you out. He shot down all of my arguments. So now they're giving us evidence to kind of illustrate this idea of language um, framing how our lives are metaphors. And I'm starting to understand it. So they're saying that this concept of argument is expressed in language through metaphors. And we think of it in the same way as a metaphor, that argument is more like a war than it is really whatever the reality of an argument is. It is important to see that we don't just talk about arguments in terms of war. We can actually win or lose arguments. We see the person we are arguing with as an opponent. We attack his positions and we defend our own. We gain and lose ground. We plan and use strategies. That's more evidence to what I was talking about earlier about how um, it's not just language that's a metaphor for us. It's our whole life, which is just evidence that the author's talking about. Many of the things we do in arguing are partially structured by the concept of war. Though there is no physical battle, there is a verbal battle, and the structure of an argument, attack, defense, counterattack, etc., reflects this. It is in this sense that the argument is war metaphor is one that we live by in this culture. It structures the actions we perform in arguing. So I do struggle with these philosophical passages because I find the language difficult to interpret, but I do uh, find them interesting when I am able to interpret them. So I like this passage so far. By the time we're here, um, my main idea hasn't changed much since the last time I summarized it. They've just added more evidence. Try to imagine a culture where arguments are not viewed in terms of war, where no one wins or loses, where there is no sense of attacking or defending, gaining or losing ground. Imagine a culture where an argument is viewed as a dance, the participants are seen as performers, and the goal is to perform in a balanced and aesthetically pleasing way. In such a culture, people would view arguments differently, experience them differently, carry them out differently, and talk about them differently, but we would probably not view them as arguing at all. They would simply be doing something different. It would seem strange even to call what they were doing arguing. Perhaps the most neutral way of describing this difference between their culture and ours would be to say that we have a discourse form structured in terms of battle, and they have one structured in terms of dance. So this is a completely new argument that they've introduced in the last paragraph, saying that this idea, these metaphors can be cultural, that they can be different. And to me, it adds into as the third argument in the whole passage. The first being that we live uh, by the metaphor. The second being that uh, language is an important way to see how we live by the metaphor. And the last one being that um, not only language, but the metaphors that we live by can be cultural and they can be different from one another. If I was going to do a main idea for this passage, I would say something along the lines of this. The concepts which we live by are linguistically, mentally, and physically metaphorical and can vary among groups. So you see how I got my three uh, big arguments in there. They are the big pillars of my main idea and they kind of form the main idea. So let's go straight into the questions. The first question, number 37, says the central thesis of the passage is that... So... um, If you're not aware, when they say central thesis, they are meaning main idea. So what is the main idea of the passage? Let's just find one um, that kind of fits in line with our main idea. The main thing here is that we don't pick arguments, that we pick something that represents the entire passage rather than just one paragraph or another. A, we are basically unaware of our conceptual system. If anything, that's an argument, but I also don't know that the author said that we are basically unaware. He said that we are normally unaware, that we are typically unaware. I don't know if basically means the same thing, Um, but the reason why I'm not picking this is because that is just an argument. B, a culture can view argument as an aesthetically pleasing dance or as a war. So if you were kind of relying on your recency effect here, you might remember that last paragraph a little bit too much and kind of um, overemphasize it in your main idea, but that was just a small argument. C, metaphors control our perceptions, thoughts, and actions. That's very good. That's a good main idea, a good central thesis, and I'm, I'm liking it as the correct answer. But let's look at D. Metaphor is a poetic as well as a rhetorical device. So I initially want to throw out that that's just an argument, but I actually don't even think that's really an argument. Um, The author talked about metaphors in a linguistic way, but um, he was mainly talking about it as linguistic versus as something that controls our thoughts and perceptions. 
not so much as poetic versus rhetorical. I think those are both kind of in the umbrella of linguistic, and he didn't really um, tease apart anything specific about the linguistics. So he's the best answer here. 38, given the claims made in the passage, the expressions, she's brimming with vim and vigor, she's overflowing with vitality, he's devoid of energy, and I don't have any energy left at the end of the day would suggest that. So skimming over the answer choices here, I can see that they are basically saying, hey, these are all metaphors. And what is um, the meaning of the words within these metaphors if we think about them in a literal way? A, some people have more energy than other people. Of course, that's true, but I don't think that that's what these metaphors are saying. So I'll just put a maybe beside it for now. B, most people wish they had more energy. I don't see anything in these metaphors that would point to that being the correct answer. C, many people think of vitality as a substance. So I can see what they're saying here. Look at this second one. She's overflowing with vitality. You normally, you know, you you can overflow a mug with coffee. You can overflow a sink with water. Um, and so we're thinking of a substance or even a fluid. And so it would make sense that many people thinking of vitality as a substance would come across linguistically by saying things like she's overflowing with vitality or she's brimming with vim and vigor, which would probably be like uh, synonyms for vitality. So I like that one and I even like it better than A. D, some people think that vitality affects our ability to argue. Uh, these don't have anything to do with arguing. That is a, a trap to try to get you to pick that because it talked about argument so much in the passage. D answers the question the best here. 39, according to the passage, if a speaker says, I've never won an argument with him, he or she is most likely thinking that. So again, it kind of gives us a metaphor and it's actually one that they were kind of talking about in the passage about how arguments can be won or lost. So if the speaker says that they lose arguments or that um, they've never won an argument with him. How does that speak to how that person views arguments is what this question is asking. Says A, arguments are violent. So maybe um, because it does say kind of that you can win and lose arguments and perhaps there's some violence involved. I don't love it, but I'll put a maybe. B, arguments are like contests. Uh, so I like that one. And I like it because you can win and lose contests. And here the speaker is saying that arguments are something that they are winning or that they are losing, just like a contest. So I like B. The conceptual systems are metaphorical. So that was a, a big thing that the author was saying, uh, you know, a, a big chunk of the main idea perhaps, but uh, that's not what this question is referencing or that this uh, saying I've never won an argument with him is referencing. I think that's just trying to get you to pick something that's along the line of the main idea but here that's not exactly what we want it. D competition is unpleasant. So the speaker isn't saying anything about competition being unpleasant by this saying right here. If anything I think this question is basically giving you another metaphor kind of like the last one and saying what does this metaphor really mean? And it means that this person is viewing arguments like contests. 40, the ideas discussed in this passage would likely be of most use to. So again, when it says the ideas discussed in the passage, it's just referencing uh, that main idea. A, an ambassador to a different culture. So automatically, I'm thinking of that last paragraph where they talked about how different cultures can view uh, concepts as different uh, metaphors. So I can kind of see how an ambassador might benefit from knowing, one, that the culture that they are in could be viewing um, a concept that he's referencing in a different way, and two, um, how he can more effectively go about communicating uh, those differences or communicating the concept that they are trying to get across. So maybe. I want a better answer, though. B, a senator engaged in a serious debate. So now I'm thinking about um, how much it talked about arguments in the passage. But to me, if a senator is engaged in a serious debate right then and there, what does it matter that he knows that, you know, conceptually that this argument that he is um, engaged in or this debate is like war or can be won or lost or that um, he has an opponent? I don't see how that's beneficial to the senator at all. So I don't like that one. It wants you to pick it because um, it's kind of a debate is kind of like an argument. And it talked about arguments so much in the passage. It just, it's bait. It, it wants you to just latch onto that bait. But if we really think about it, what would be the use of the main idea that we got 
in a serious debate for a senator? Probably nothing. C, a financial analyst for a large corporation. Again, I just don't understand how it would be helpful to know anything about metaphors or our conceptual system. I can make more connections with A, and that's why I'm crossing C out. D, a general preparing for battle. So this is the same reason why um, B is attractive. Um, That's the same reason why D is attractive, because we talked about arguments. We talked about war um, in the passage, and so it wants you to pick this. But I cannot think of anything special about knowing that this battle that the general is about to go into is, is like an argument. I don't know. I'm trying to make like the opposite association, so I don't think that that's helpful. I think A is the best one. 41, the expression, this is driving me around the bend, and they were pushed off the deep end, would best support a metaphor that compares sanity to... So in my experience, this question has always given students a really hard time. So I want to take some time with it. And my best advice for this is to think about a real example. This is driving me around the bend. If you've ever heard this metaphor, you know, it's talking about something stressful, some stressor in your life. So think about a stressful stressful thing in your life. How about MCAT studying? So in this metaphor, what is this? This would be the stressor. So let's put MCAT studying. MCAT studying is driving me around the bend. So if MCAT studying or whatever stressor you have in your life is successful in driving you all the way around the bend, then what would you be after you got around the bend? You'd be insane, correct? So around the bend, whatever is around there is going to be insanity. Now we have MCAT studying is driving me insane. So we're looking for something that's comparing sanity. In this metaphor, is sanity A, a location? Well, let's think about where sanity would fit into this metaphor here. If MCAT studying is driving you insane, aren't you currently starting out at a sane place? Otherwise, you would already be insane. Nothing would be driving you insane. You'd already be insane. So currently, you are sane. So I thought a picture might help too. So If this is the bend and we're driving around it, then MCAT studying is probably the car or perhaps a chauffeur. And you're going to end up insane if you get around the bend. So you are starting off sane in a sane location and you'll end up at an insane location. So would sanity be a location? Yes. Would it be a vehicle? No, MCAT studying would probably be the vehicle, right? What would be the road? I honestly don't really know what the road would be in this metaphor. Maybe the few months that you're studying for MCAT, I don't, I don't really know what the road would be, but I don't think it sanity would be the road. And D, a force, um, it is more likely a location than it is a force. If you want to talk about the other one, they were pushed off the deep end, and what would sanity be in that case? Well, the deep end would probably be insanity, and sanity would probably be the cliff that they're standing on or whatever. But sanity being a cliff, a cliff is still a location. So it's the same thought process. 42 says, according to information in the passage, how would a member from a culture that views argument as a dance argue their point? So we were given a little bit of insight to this in the passage, and it said... The participants are seen as performers. The goal is to perform in a balanced and aesthetically pleasing way. So let's find an answer choice that kind of is in line with that. A, by methodically attacking a person's weaker claims. So attacking here is a um, language that insinuates that argument is a war. It's more like American values. So that's not the right answer. B, by calmly responding to a person's points. So that makes more sense because I think that a calm discussion where the, the conversation is very balanced and things, that would be more aesthetically pleasing and more like a dance is. Dancers respond to each other's on the stage and that is kind of how I'm imagining that arguments work in this um, made up culture. So I like B. C, by explaining that arguments are like dances. Well, do we, as a culture that views argument as war, do we explain in the middle of an argument that it's like war? Not really. That's kind of weird. D, by irrationally defending their position. Again, defending is language that insinuates the argument is like war. And so B is going to be the best one. All right, guys, I hope that helped. Um, That passage was mostly, all the questions were 
pretty well answered by the main idea and pretty well answered by your knowledge of how metaphors kind of work um, and how we were taught how they worked in the passage. So if you like that video, hit like and subscribe or leave a comment down below telling us what you want to see next. But I will see you in the next one.